In the news and historic summit between Chinese and Soviet leaders, the United States turns to diplomacy to try to oust Panama's Manuel Noriega, and there's little movement in the Los Angeles teachers' strike. In sports, the Pistons, uh, well, their NB playoff series will have that story, and the Toronto Blue Jays fire their manager. There's a chance of severe weather in parts of Texas, Alan Abelson on the surging dollar. I'm John Palmer, Deborah Norville's on assignment, and this is Tuesday, May 16th. This is NBC News at Sunrise with Deborah Norville. In Beijing this morning, inside the Great Wall of the People's House, Mikhail Gorbachev and Deng Xiaoping shook hands and sat down to talk. It's the first meeting between top Chinese and Soviet leaders in more than a generation. But the historic session has nearly upstaged, was nearly upstaged by an event equally significant for the communist world, the hunger strike by thousands of students just across the street. More on the summit and the demonstration from NBC's Keith Miller in Beijing. Student demonstration for democracy disrupted the schedule of the Sino-Soviet summit for the second day. A wreath-laying ceremony in Tiananmen Square by visiting Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev had to be cancelled. But inside the Great Hall of the People, Gorbachev made peace with a former enemy. There was no bear hug, but Deng Xiaoping and Mikhail Gorbachev shook hands and smiled to the cameras, formally ending 30 years of hostility. Referring to past animosity, Gorbachev said this period has come to an end. Both men are credited with instituting reform, and both view this summit as a triumph. A Soviet spokesman said he hoped the demonstration outside would not overshadow the significance of the summit. But in the square, the students were drawing as much attention as the formal meetings nearby. Hunger strikers were growing weak, and many needed medical attention. Gorbachev's meeting with Premier Li Peng had to be moved, since security forces were concerned about crowd control. The summit is indeed historic, but the significance of the event surrounding it could not have been lost on the leaders of the world's two largest communist parties. Keith Miller, NBC News, Beijing. The United States this morning is trying to put the diplomatic squeeze on Panama's dictator Manuel Noriega. The White House is reportedly asking Latin American countries to withdraw their ambassadors from Panama in a bid to force Noriega to quit. At the same time, sources in Panama say the U.S. is trying to encourage the military to overthrow the dictator. Despite a failed coup last year, diplomats and opposition leaders agree only the military can force Noriega out anytime soon. In this country, 600,000 Los Angeles school children are wondering whether they'll graduate on time this year. They are caught in the middle of a pay dispute between striking teachers and a school board determined to hold the line. As NBC's Keith Morrison reports, neither side has shown any signs of backing down. For much of the day, school administrators met to consider their response to the teacher's strike. Met in secret. There were some informal negotiations. By the end of the day, there was still no settlement. Remember, but from the school board, an admission that substitute teachers are hard to find. They voted to increase the pay for strike-breaking substitutes to almost $170 a day up from the usual $100. The teachers first. About three quarters of L.A. County's more than 30,000 teachers are striking, demanding a pay increase of 21% over two years and increased authority in their own schools. And while negotiators argue over the money, 600,000 students are wondering if or how they can graduate in six weeks from now. Although these students made it clear, if they had to pick a side, they'd pick the teachers. Keith Morrison, NBC News, Los Angeles. In Alaska today, investigators from the National Transportation Safety Board will open hearings into the Valdez oil spill. More than two dozen witnesses will appear before the panel over the next five days. But Captain Joseph Hazelwood, who was in command when the tanker ran aground in March, has declined to testify. Hazelwood goes on trial in Alaska next month, charged with operating that tanker while drunk. In Washington, the president's plan for his war on crime is under attack this morning from both sides of the gun issue. Gun control advocates want President Bush to back a complete ban on semi-automatic weapons, but the gun lobby feels the president has gone too far already. More from NBC News reporter Jim Miklaszewski. 
Shielded behind bulletproof glass, a tough-talking President Bush unveiled his anti-crime package. We're going to take back the streets by taking criminals off the streets. To do that, the President wants to improve the odds that criminals will get caught and do time in prison. Bush recommends tougher gun laws with mandatory prison terms and wants to spend an additional $1 billion for more federal prisons, lawmen, and prosecutors. But on controversial gun control, President Bush rejected calls for an outright ban on so-called semi-automatic assault weapons. Instead, he wants a ban on gun magazines of more than 15 rounds. Too weak for gun control advocates. You've got to ban the semi-automatic weapons if you're going to do, do anything truly effective. But too strong for the NRA. When he got into the gun issue, he sounded a lot like Michael Dukakis and talking about the very things he assured the American public he wouldn't do if he was elected president. Lawmen and lawmakers alike say that while the president's plan may be a step in the right direction, it just doesn't go far enough. Jim McLeshevsky, NBC News, at the White House. Coming up in sports, the Blue Jays boot their manager and the Phillies win in extra innings on an inside-the-park home run. Don Crickey has the highlights right after this. Ready for school every morning in my house is not easy. Sisters are a big obstacle. They're always where you want to be, trying to make themselves beautiful. I tell them it's hopeless. Somehow, I make it to breakfast. Today, something is different. Mom is putting potatoes in the toaster. A right of toaster hash browns. This is a miracle. Now I can have real potatoes for breakfast on a school day and still make the bus on time. If I were going to create the perfect place, I'd start with the north. I would carve out rivers and rolling hills, then ride the moon south and warm the skies with a tropical sun. I would dot the west with little hometowns and fill the east with excitement. Right in the middle, I'd put a great big playground. I would surround it all with water from coast to coast to coast. And I'd give it a name, Florida. Now, a Tuesday morning look at sports with Don Crickey. Morning, Don. Morning, John. The two teams that met for the NBA championship last year, the Lakers and the Pistons, are in excellent form again. Both are unbeaten in the playoffs this year, having swept their first two opponents. The Pistons in the dark uniforms ousted Milwaukee last night. Isaiah Thomas strips the ball. He had a triple-double for Detroit and leads Joe Dumas here for a score. As Bucks coach Dale Harris watched his team lose a 21-point lead and the game, 96-94. Ricky Pierce intentionally missed this free throw because the Bucks needed a field goal. Time ran out when the ball came into the backcourt and Chuck Daly's Pistons advanced to the conference finals against the Chicago-New York winner. The Bulls lead 3-1 there and are at New York tonight. Phoenix can advance with a win over Golden State tonight. When baseball managers are hired, they really begin the countdown to the day they'll be fired. The Toronto Blue Jays cashier Jimmy Williams yesterday and replaced him with coach Cito Gaston on an interim basis. Gaston is 1-0 as a manager, thanks to this two-run home run by George Bell, a longtime nemesis of Jimmy Williams, as Toronto beat Cleveland 5-3. Oakland routed Milwaukee 12-2. The Yankees and the Angels were tied 3 all in the bottom of the 11th last night at Anaheim, when Wally Joyner lofted a fly ball to center off Yankee reliever Dave Rigetti. Devon White tagged up and easily beat Pat Kelly's throw to give California a 4-3 win. Kansas City beat Minnesota. Detroit edged Chicago. In the National League, the Dodgers and the Mets hooked up for the first time since the National League playoffs last fall. Dodgers second sacker Willie Randolph made the play of the night on Howard Johnson's hard hit bouncer into the hole. The Dodgers went on to win 3-1 when pinch hitter Mariano Duncan delivered a two-run single in the ninth. The Reds with three in the ninth inning won again and remain on top in the NL West. The Cubs ended a five-game losing streak. The Padres edged the Expos. The most dramatic ending of the season to date came late last night in Philadelphia. The Giants led the Phillies 2-0 with two on and two out in the bottom of the 12th inning. Bob Dernier was the Phillies' last hope. Line drive, fair ball. Mitchell can't get it. Nine runs to the score. They're waving Dernier. He's the winning run. We got a play, and he's safe. Game's over. All right. To 
Wayne Kuyper with the call as Philly fans went home late but happy. Indeed, they were happy. Thank you very much, Don. The rain hangs on in the east and the rough weather continues for parts of Texas. Joe Woody's forecast next on NBC News at Sunrise. Samsonite wants to show you the difference between being loaded down and loaded up with our piggyback. Now, which way would you ever travel? With Samsonite's piggyback, of course. The boy who cried wolf. Help! My Isuzu Trooper stuck in the mud. Ha ha! My Trooper has four-wheel drive and a powerful engine, so it won't get stuck. Help! I can't fit all this firewood in my Trooper. Ha ha! It can carry all this and five adults. Help! Whoa. I'll never lie again. I'll never lie again. Help! Whoa! Now you could save up to $1,000 on the versatile Trooper during Isuzu's 75th birthday blowout. Feel your oats with Post Oat Flakes. Feel your oats with Post Oat Flakes. Golden toasted flakes with whole grain oat nutrition and a crunchy oat taste. Feel your oats with Post Oat Flakes. Information about asthma, emphysema, and other lung diseases is right at your fingertips. Call the specially trained nurse at Lungline, a free telephone service of the National Jewish Center for Immunology and Respiratory Medicine in Denver. That's toll free, 1-800-222-LUNG. Racers are prepared for danger. The probability is there. You don't even start a race car without your seatbelt on. Without it, I wouldn't even be here. Man, I know what to expect on the track. It's driving with amateurs on the highway that scares me. Drive like a pro. Buckle up. In London, a group of actors led by Sir Laurence Olivier have just completed a very successful two-day run. They have managed to save the Rose Theatre, at least for now. The Rose Theatre was a 16th century playhouse where Shakespeare is said to have been performed. A developer wants to build an office tower on top of the building's remains. The actors held a two-day vigil, and Monday morning they blocked a cement truck. The developer later relented, agreeing to a one-month delay to see if the theatre can be saved. And now to tell us about the weather in Pittsburgh and other places, here's Joe Woody. Joe? Well, I'm going to go in the umbrella business in Pittsburgh. It's day number 16 with rain and perhaps a, another day or two to go, John. Good morning, everyone. We're finding the conditions of that fickle jet stream that's caused that drought over the Great Plains is beginning to show a sign of change. The jet stream this past week has been bringing some rains to the western plains. That wind flow over California, then up over Texas, is pumping in moisture from the Pacific and the Gulf of Mexico over the western plains. But look for some heavy rains of three inches for parts of that area. And keep an eye out for some local flooding as well as the potential of twisters. In the Northeast, rain for Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, New York, and Boston again today. Sunny skies for Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Chicago, and Atlanta. That's a quick look at the national weather. Now here's what's happening in your neighborhood. Well, places like Dallas, Fort Worth, threat of a thunderstorm, a high of 84 degrees. Look at Minneapolis, St. Paul, 83. And sunny skies, Miami, 90. Denver, 60 degrees. I'm mean, next, possible trouble spots for air travelers on this Tuesday. John? Thank you, Joe. Well, the news continues in just a moment. You're watching NBC News at Sunrise. I'm Brian Gumbel. Later this morning on Today, a Soviet-American experiment in openness. I'm Jane Pauley, also Sean Connery and Patrick Swayze. That's later this morning on Today. Mississippians have a special spirit, all their own. A sense of pride, accomplishment, and genuine concern for their neighbors that shows in the way they live every day. Hear their stories as we introduce you to one of these special people every Thursday night on WTVA News. And if you know of someone who should be honored, write us at WTVA, P.O. Box 350, Tupelo, Mississippi 38802, as we continue to find and recognize the people who live the spirit of Mississippi. Spin the Wheel of Fortune Monday through Saturday nights at 6.30.
These are some of the stories we're following this morning on NBC News at Sunrise and historic meeting in Beijing. The teacher protest continues in Los Angeles and apple growers respond to consumer pressure about Alar. Details coming up. This morning on America's Vital Signs, the NBC News series on health care, a report on the latest food craze, oat bran. It's become increasingly popular as the word has spread that eating oat bran is one way to lower cholesterol. But as Fred Briggs explains this morning, not everybody agrees that oat bran is all that it's cracked up to be. There was a time when oat bran was something fed to horses, and if people ate it, it was in the form of hot oatmeal on a cold morning. Now it's flakes, muffins, bread, pancakes, cookies, even pretzels. All because a study more than a year ago showed that the bran, the layer beneath the hull of the common oat, has properties that can reduce cholesterol levels in the blood of those who eat it regularly. When they eat about 39 grams of oat bran a day, then it seems as if the blood cholesterol is lowered by 3%. 39 grams. If it's this cereal, that would require about five bowlfuls a day. Nonetheless, oat bran has come out of the health food closet, and it seems everyone is on the bran wagon. Kellogg's Common Sense Oat Bran has more oat bran than any leading ready-to-eat cereal. It's a great time to be in the oat business. We saw demand go from about a million pounds a year to more than a million pounds a month currently, and that demand is continuing to increase. Some oat bran cereals can be high in sodium and sugar and pack a lot of calories. And if whole milk is added, forget about lowering cholesterol. But it's not just cereals anymore. Blueberry oat bran and a large apple raisin oat bran, please. Muffins, pancakes, donuts, items often rich in fat or sugar, which the buyer may not know. If you start with a food that's not good for you, like a donut or a potato chip, just adding oat bran is not going to transform it into a health food. Another problem, domestic oats are in short supply, partly because of the drought, but mostly because farmers get more money for growing corn and wheat. Many mills are buying oats from overseas. This one in Texas does not, and that has caused it some problems. We've been out of stock during a part of the last, uh, say, six months because the quality of oat bran available has not been plentiful enough to meet the demand. Oat bran's major drawback may be that some think one bowl in the morning lets them eat fatty food the rest of the day. Oat bran is just only one aspect of lowering cholesterol. It's not the magic bullet. Nor is this, which is being called the next nutritional craze. It's said to have all the benefits of oat bran and it tastes much better, but be warned. The only studies done thus far involved hamsters. Fred Briggs, NBC News, Boston. The eight members of an international team that walked from northwestern Canada to the North Pole are back in Canada this morning. The members of the Ice Walk team, scarred from frostbite and visibly tired, spent 56 days hiking and skiing from the Northwest Territories to the top of the world. Today they'll fly to Ottawa for medical treatment. The goal of their 600-mile ice walk was to call attention to the fragile nature of the Earth's environment. And coming up, more on the Soviet-China summit this morning, and we'll have the market report. Alan Abelson will be along to discuss the suddenly strong dollar. And Joe Witte will have yet another check of the weather coming up. Stay with us. Topping our news this morning, the possible end to the 30-year-old Soviet-Chinese Cold War. The thaw between the Chinese and the Soviets began today in Beijing with a handshake in the Great Hall of the People. And then Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev and Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping sat down for a two-and-a-half-hour meeting. Overshadowing the cordial meeting of the communist leaders were the thousands of students who remain in the city's main square demanding political and social reform. In this country, for the second day in a row, teachers in Los Angeles will be standing on the picket lines instead of before the blackboards. 
Over 20,000 teachers demanding a 21% pay increase stayed away from school yesterday. Their places in the classroom were taken by nearly 13,000 substitute teachers. With sales of apples and other news severely hurt, apple growers are voluntarily ending the use of the controversial chemical Alar. The International Apple Institute says use of the chemical which regulates growth that extends shelf life should be phased out by September. On Capitol Hill, there were charges that an EPA advisory panel had blocked a ban on Alar four years ago because of ties to the chemical industry. We have determined that seven out of the eight members of this supposedly independent scientific panel, this panel that effectively kept Alar on apples after the EPA wanted to ban it in 1985, were at that very time receiving income from the chemical industry. Consumer advocate Ralph Nader called for an immediate ban on Alar. Some anxious moments in San Francisco during a protest over U.S. involvement in El Salvador. Two members of a group called the Pledge of Resistance tried to unfurl a banner from the 180-foot Coit Tower, but one climber got tangled in his gear. When firefighters brought him back to Earth, he was arrested along with eight fellow protesters. Mexico's move to modernize its economy tops our business news. The Mexican government has announced a sweeping liberalization of its foreign investment regulations. Among other things, the changes will now permit 100% foreign ownership of many Mexican businesses. Stock prices continue to soar in moderately active trading on Monday. The Dow Jones Industrial Average gained more than 24 points to close at their second straight post-crash high, 24.6389. Standard & Poor's 500 stock index closed at 316.16, up 2.32. The Shirts & Lehman Long-Term Treasury Bond Index closed slightly lower, and in London this morning, U.S. long bonds are down from yesterday's close in New York. Looking ahead to today's market day, here's Wall Street Journal's Randall Smith. Good morning, Randall. Good morning, John. Are we into a big bull market now, well, officially? Well, we, uh, we've come three-fourths of the way back from the uh, pre-crash high. In other words, we, we've gained back three-fourths of the losses uh, that came and started in October 87. Uh, we're up 80 points in the last two days. So this morning in London, naturally, there's a little bit of selling. People are taking a breather from all this uh, good news. Are the profit takers likely to be seen in great evidence on Wall Street today? Uh, a little. It could be. There, there's a bad news story in the Wall Street Journal this morning, a little bit of disappointment. The, the Fed policymakers are meeting today, and, and our story says that they're unlikely to ease interest rates. That is, lower them uh, at the moment, uh, even though we've had some good news that the economy's slowing down and inflation looks, looks not too bad. Uh, it, they, they seem to think it's too soon to lower interest rates because we need a little bit more evidence. We've got a some, lot of action in the Disney stock of late. Uh, last two, three days, uh, it's up uh, seven points or more, and they had an analyst meeting uh, last week suggesting that this new theme park in Florida, attendance is pretty good. That has squeezed some short sellers and forced them to buy back stock at higher prices. Thank you, Randall. Have a nice day. Thank you, Bob. Good job. The dollar is down at early European trading today. It's lower against the Japanese yen, off slightly against the West German mark, and down a bit against the British pound. The price of gold at 9 o'clock in London was $374.80 an ounce, and that's down 80 cents from yesterday's close in New York. When we come back, Alan Abelson looks at the reasons behind the recent surge in the dollar. Stay with us. <laughs> lesson in refreshment. Ocean spray cran apple. Ah. Yeah, la, 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 la. La, 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 la. So tangy. La, 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 la. So crisp. La, 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 la. So cool. La, 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 la. Ocean spray. Taste refreshing ocean spray cran apple. It's music to your mouth. Ah. Do you know the secret of a great night's sleep? Caitlin recommends holding a tattered old blanket. Blanky. Okay, blanky. That's a good idea for you, sweetheart, but grown-ups need something more substantial. I'm Ernest Williger. My company makes Stearns and Foster mattresses. They're firm, comfortable, and give us grown-ups a great night's sleep. Since you've outgrown a blanky, get a Stearns and Foster mattress. Norman, what's 
that? Nothing, honey. Yeah, that's a simple question. Norman, are you eating something? It's nothing, honey. He lies like a dog. Kellogg's Nut and Honey Crunch. Crisp golden flakes glazed with sweet honey and real roasted peanuts. Irene, what's that you're playing? Nothing, honey. Two can play this little game. Kellogg's Nut and Honey Crunch. The dollar has been flexing its muscles for some time now. It's at its highest level against the West German mark since, oh, since 1986, and yesterday rose sharply against other currencies. With us now this morning is Sunrise business correspondent and Barron's editor, Alan Abelson. He's here to flex his muscles and tell us what's wrong with a strong dollar, Alan. Well, I don't think uh, anything terribly wrong with a strong dollar. Uh, of course, what happens, John, is that if our dollar continues to appreciate, and if it goes too high, then our exports get uncompetitive, and next thing you know, our trade gap widens really horrendously. It's bad enough as it is, we really don't want to see that happen. But frankly, I don't see anything particularly wrong with the strong dollar at the moment. You know, people forget the dollar just a few years ago fetched 263 yen, and it got down to 121 yen in just about a couple of three years. Why so, is this happening, though? At this right point, now, it, everybody I think loves our economy, or what I is it? think that's part of it. Everybody loves our economy. Everybody's a little worried. If you live in Japan, they've had a terrible scandal. The political situation is very upset. People are worried. They send their dollars over here. The same thing is true in Germany. I think also, you know, the dollar has just been undervalued, John. You can, a dollar, you can buy an awful lot for a dollar in New York compared uh, to the equivalent of man yen in Japan. And I think inevitably these things start to balance out, and that's what we're seeing now. I don't think it's anything mysterious. That I, I've all along thought we'd get at least to 160 yen to a dollar on this move. Well, does this mean that Congress is going to look at this and say, hey, we've got to start protecting our industries now because of the strong dollar? That's a good point, John, and I think that's one of the real dangers. Congress has been really, you know, this is like red meat to dogs. I mean, <laughs> they, they do smell this thing. They've been wanting to impose protectionist restraints, uh, really, for the last three, four years. And I think this is one excuse, if it continues, to, to give them an opening. I think the administration is going to have to do something here what we're really seeing is a shootout between the speculators and the central bankers, and so far, the speculators are winning. Okay, thank you, Alan. <laughs> okay. Have a very nice day. Joe Woody, back now with a check of travel conditions all around the country. Joe? Thanks, John. Once again, the Great Plains will be the trouble spot for travelers. The latest view from space shows 60,000 foot thunderstorms over Oklahoma, and I expect more thunderstorms today, so look for travel delays, Dallas, Fort Worth to Denver, with a threat of some severe storms. And I expect delays this morning on the northeastern shuttle flights due to rain. Washington, D.C.'s high will go up to 64 degrees. Miami, warm at 90 degrees, but a threat of showers. And look at uh, Minneapolis, 83 degrees. Out west, mostly fair skies. L.A.'s high, 71. San Francisco in the mid-70s. Seattle's high, 67 degrees, but the threat of rain by late tomorrow for Seattle. That's my latest. Have a safe trip. John? Thank you, Joe. That's NBC News at Sunrise for this Tuesday morning. I'm John Palmer. Deborah Dorval returns tomorrow. Have a very good day.